world has a teleology, a destination in God. Mankind in its history is moving toward that great harvest, which in the image of the grain harvest, the catch of the fish, or the wine press, is a constant theme in scripture. This indicates that earthly history is unfolding toward a final day when the time for free decisions will have run out and the harvest will be brought into the eternal barns. Such an end, however, taking place within the dimensions of the world raises a difficult problem. Is there anything corresponding to it in the life of heaven? What is certain is that our earthly existence, though refined and transformed in God's fire, will enter into heaven. The new world will remain our world. In heaven, the life we have led on earth will not be only a memory, but something like an abiding presence. How is this possible? We must again return to the reciprocity of heaven and earth. Everything that is lived in a fragmentary and incomplete way on earth has always had its ultimate ground in heaven. No earthly moment can be fully exhausted. Whatever eternal content it contains, and our temporal existence cannot bring it forth out of the depths, is laid up for us in heaven. In heaven we shall live the full and eternal content of what on earth was present only as a transcendent, insatisfiable longing. This is at least one aspect of heavenly life. In heaven, therefore, our earthly existence, and we have only one existence, will be present in an unimaginable and unimaginably true manner. We must try to understand that even when all history in this temporal plane has come to an end and passed away, everyone who has lived on earth will possess his earthly existence, not only as a memory of what is past, but as something that is proper to him, albeit something that has undergone the renunciation of death and the purifying transformation of the fire of God's judgment. Here the failings of his earthly existence will be as evident to himself as to others. They will be confessed just as will his virtues. He will be as little ashamed of the former as he will be proud of the latter, for it is by God's grace that he has been redeemed, and the life he leads before God and in the communion of saints is in every respect to the praise of his glorious grace. So the question that occupied Therese of Lisieux whether the pardoned sinner, the red rose, or the one who has not sinned, the white rose, loves God more, remains insoluble, because the grace of Christ's redemption in its fullness is visible in both of them. There is no envy in heaven, only gratitude for every greater grace whoever may have received it. The image of the ripening grain and the harvest that is such a constant theme in the parables of Jesus says both things. It says that everything earthly grows toward heaven. And it also says that in this process, heaven is not only the future, but always the perfecting factor and the present. The more the heavenly dimension governs and penetrates an earthly life in terms of mind, action, and surrender, 
the riper this life is for heaven, and the less God's refining fire will have to burn away. Earthly missions are contained and brought to perfection in heaven. The earthly mission always originates in heaven, and even on earth has an effect that transcends the earth and reaches up into heaven. Only when the grain of wheat dies can it bring forth much fruit, and it is impossible to say whether it has greater effect in heaven or on earth.